and it's going to be kind of a, well, it's going to be a verse-by-verse -verse topical sort of thing. We're going to be looking at a particular concept that I'll go into in just a minute. Now, in the totality of the Gospel of John, there are seven miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ that are mentioned here. Now, each of them is designed to teach a man a spiritual lesson based upon the ministry of Jesus Christ to illustrate who he is and why he has come. John's purpose in writing this gospel, we saw at the beginning, was to display Jesus Christ as God, to show us the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. The miracles that John tells us, well, the first one was the changing of water to wine. And what we saw, we saw the joy of the Lord as he entered in to the bondage of legalism. There's the healing of the broken man, I'm sorry, the nobleman's son, not the broken man, the nobleman's son, and we saw as all was necessary for the Lord to move was for that man to believe. And we saw his progression of belief. There's the healing of the paralytic man, this man who was in a helpless, hopeless situation. And the point is, that man could do absolutely nothing for himself, but Christ entered in and did everything that he needed. There was the feeding of the 5,000, and we saw God's method of ministry as we take our humble offerings to the Lord, and the Lord multiplies them for the benefit of those whom we've been called to minister to. There was the Lord Jesus Christ as He walked on water, and that Jesus Christ is Lord over all creation. Here we have the healing of the blind men, and in a couple of weeks we'll have the raising of Lazarus from the dead, because again, God is the Lord over death as well. And before John concludes his gospel, he tells us in John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now there are some that were told about in other gospels, but when he says many others, I'm sure there's those that we just don't really know about. Be interesting to know what they were but not necessary, because John says, but these, the ones that he has written about, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, or Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. Well, if he's the Son of God, that means that he is God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So John says, I presented the necessary miracles. And we know, just reading through the Gospel, he's presented the necessary scriptures that Jesus was to fulfill. And so in John's mind, he's given exhaustive study of who Christ is and why Jesus Christ is God and the promised Messiah so that you can have a confidence in believing I can have life in his name. With the healing of the blind men, the Lord's purpose is repeated by Jesus. We saw it last week in verse 3 of chapter 9. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And so there's a lesson. There's a lesson to be learned in what Christ did in the life of this man. And again, Jesus is giving us these lessons for the purpose of training his disciples, which you're not, you weren't there, but you're a disciple, and you, we all need to have that continual training today, but also to we, that we would also know the degree to which the Lord is able to move and how he moves in the lives of his people. So, in looking at this blind man, in this blind man, we need to see all humanity that is apart from Christ. This man was stricken with this defect from birth. All humanity is stricken with a defect from birth, and that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's why John said in John chapter 3 that man is condemned from the womb. We are condemned already. Nothing needs to happen. We are already condemned. God's not waiting for your first sin to condemn you. It's your sinful nature that needs to be dealt with. That's why we, and seriously, that's why we don't have confession. I mean, how silly is that to go climb into a booth and, well, I did this three times, I did that four times, and, and just go through the list. I mean, seriously, are you going to be taking the list anyway? And then I'll be sitting in there for hours and hours listening to all your sins. I have to take a shower halfway in between. Ew. But then I'd have to do something with my sin. It'd just be a big old mess. No, when Jesus died and when he forgave you of your sins, that's yeah, plural. That means he forgave you of all of your sins. And really what that means is he's healed you of your sinful nature, at least in his sight. And if the Son has set us free, then we're free indeed. This man, this man who is blind from birth, is in an incurable position 
that again, just like the lame man, this guy can do nothing about it. He's somebody, though, as Christ encounters him here in chapter 9, that's trying to make the best of the situation. So once again, it's the same exact thing that everybody apart from Christ in the world is doing today. They're doing right now. They're stricken with this defect from birth, as we just said, sin. They're in an incurable position that they can do absolutely nothing about. There's not a person that can make themselves right in the sight of God. And also, they're trying to do the best they can with the situation that they're in. And again, of the mindset, keep of the mindset, this is apart from God. And so, this man, he never asked Christ for anything, but Christ enters into his life. Matter of fact, the only thing he did ask Christ for was money, I just assume because later on, further on down, we're told that this man was a beggar. And so he was just asking for something to, to ease his condition, asking for something that he would be able to continue on. But here, in this day that Jesus Christ entered to his life, he's going to get more than he ever imagined. Remember the day? Do you remember the last day of your heathenhood? I was just talking to somebody. If I don't know a word, I'll just make one up. But the last day of your heathenhood, the last day you were apart from Christ, you woke up condemned. You woke up unsaved. You went to bed saved. There was that transition in that particular day. That what happened in that day? Well, I can't tell you all of the details because I don't know your day. But the one thing I do know is Christ came into your life. Just as surely as this man <clears throat> was doing pretty much what he did every day, the, the lame man was doing everything that he did every day, or the same thing he did every day, but there was this one day that everything changed, and it was the day that Jesus Christ entered into this man's life. Now, Jesus said in verse 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And we saw the biblical reality, even though Christ is left, we are to reflect the glory of Christ. Now, how did Christ enter in? He didn't just say, hey, here I am. He entered in through an intercessor of some sort. He used somebody to come into your life, and they shared the gospel with you. And so, by faith to faith to faith, adjusted to live by faith. And so, since that occurred in my life, how much more so should I take the lessons here and see that Christ is reflected as his glory reflects off of me, as his glory reflects off of you into the life of somebody else? Righteousness repeated and repeated and repeated. And it's been repeating again throughout all of the church age. And it needs to continue to repeat until Christ comes back. Aren't we in the end times? Well, we're in the inner times, but I don't know if we're in the actual, absolute end time. Again, Christ could go on for another, or he could allow things to go on for another 100, 200, 300 years, for all we know. Now, so many times in the Gospels, you see in the epistles that the apostles have gotten it. They got it. And there was Peter and John in Acts chapter 3. One day, they're just going into the temple. They're going to worship, and they see this man, this lame man. And what is he doing? He's doing the same thing pretty much this blind guy was doing. He's begging alms. He's begging for money. He's begging for, he's trying to make the best of his situation that he can do absolutely nothing about. And so I would imagine Peter probably looked down upon him and remembered some of the situations that he was in with the Lord Jesus Christ. And probably even with the blind man, because it's a very similar situation, or it could be with the lame man as well. And it says... This guy saw Peter, I'm in Acts chapter 3, verse 3, who seen Peter and John about to go into the temple and asked them for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he got their attention and gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He had not, not a clue what he was going to receive from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And we know that the man did that. He, he, he was healed instantly there, just simply because, well, what did he do? He gave his attention to this man, Peter, this man who saw the glory of God, a little glimpse of it here in John chapter 9, and what is he doing that day in the temple? Christ is gone, he's ascended into heaven, but what is he doing? He's reflecting the glory. As he has been taught, he is now teaching. It's the essence of every Bible study that we have. Are these things making any kind of difference in your life? I mean, seriously. 
the things that we see, you should be making these things, I say see, the things I talk about, you should be making these things applicable to your life. The things you read about in your daily devotions, you should be making these things applicable to your life, to the situations and circumstances that you deal with, and see that these things are so and these things are real. Why? Because these are the means through which Christ will move through your life. Is Christ moving through your life? Is Christ moving through your life at all? If the answer is no, then you need to reevaluate. Are you doing the things that are contained in the Word of God in order for Christ to have that opportunity? Because we give Christ, we don't give Christ permission, we don't enable Christ, don't get me wrong on that, but Christ works through His Word. And if His Word is absent, the doing of His Word is absent in your life, then you will see the works of Christ absent in your life. If the Word of God is a reality in your life, just the daily application of the Word of God in your life, then you are going to see Jesus Christ move in your life. Notice this blind man, after the healing, he cannot help but tell the people about Jesus and what he has done. In verses 8 through 11, he tells his neighbors. In verses 15 and 26, he tells the Pharisees. Verses 19 to 23, he tells his parents. The lame man that God healed through Peter, he went out and he invited others, if you will, to come to church, to come and see this great work which he has done. Peter preached and God moved. So that lame man that, that God healed, now Peter didn't heal him, but God healed him through Peter. That guy that God healed, he went and told others, they came to Peter. And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, as a result of that, however, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. 5,000 people got saved because this guy was healed, or you could say this guy got saved, and then he just did what he was supposed to do. He went and told others. What was he exercising? He was exercising his testimony. Now, he had a powerful testimony because he was physically lame, and everybody knew it. It was a normal thing to see this guy there uh, begging uh, alms. And as he was, all of a sudden he's walking, and so they, they knew that he was verified lame. But now he's what something miraculous has come, so we need to come and see. Now, you see signs and wonders, and people worship signs and wonders, and they give notoriety to people who supposedly do signs and wonders, but signs and wonders are designed by God to point man to him. Because how did these 5,000 people get saved? It wasn't through a miracle. A miracle was used but it was through the preaching of God's Word. And so any sign and wonder that you see going on out there, any ministry that speaks of signs and wonders, they had better be pointing people to the Word of God. They had better be preaching the Word of God. If they're not doing that, if it's all about the signs and wonder, then you need to bring it into question. So we see the contrast here, the blind man, a picture of every spiritual blind person in the world, and Jesus Christ, the only one who can give life to the spiritually blind, but also we must put ourselves in the position of the disciples. In the disciples, we need to see ourselves as being trained in how to meet and minister to the spiritually blind in the future. Again, I just read verses 4 and 5. Jesus is going to be departing, but that light was not extinguished. That light was not put out. Matter of fact, now instead of just having one source of light, there's many sources of light throughout the world. And again, that is to be his people as the light of Christ, the glory of Christ is reflected from us to them. Or the word as the word has been delivered to us, we now deliver the word to others. In John 14, verse 12, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. We know what he's speaking of there is the sending of the Holy Spirit that enables us in God's Word. Peter again learned this lesson and was an effective light for the Lord, doing great things, even before the saving of the 5,000 was the saving of the 3,000. Probably only men were numbered in that, so there could have even been many more. And then you kind of wonder, okay, so there's 8,000 people there, who did those people speak to? And who did those speak? Maybe you're an offspring of that. Very possible. I mean, just think about it if you work backwards or just go back to that day. 
this lame man gets saved, lame man gets saved, these people come, they hear the word, and they get saved, they tell somebody else, they tell somebody else, and for the past 2,000 years, somebody else has been telling somebody else until it arrived at the doorsteps of your heart. I mean, that's the way it works. You're related somehow, some way back to some apostle who's told somebody, who told somebody, who told somebody, who told somebody. And again, it's just an amazing concept. I've mentioned it before, but it's really amazing to me. So really what I want to look at, kind of the topical twist that we're going to be looking in our verse-by-verse study here tonight, is going to be how to effectively share the Word of God. How to effectively share. What are the things that I... Now, I'm not going to go into the, to the exact detail of what Scripture to use. The Holy Spirit will bring that to remembrance to you when you're given the opportunity. But just some of the things that we need to be aware of. And I guess maybe even the best example for you to have would be, as I mentioned these things, how did God work in your life? Because the very first person that your testimony needs to minister to is you, is you, to see the work that God... See, that's when you're going to get a confidence. That's when you're going to get a boldness when you understand that you're saved, when you understand that God's done an amazing work in you, that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. How do I know all of that? Do you even have a heart to share God's word? Do you even have a heart to do God's word? Do you have a heart to be obedient to God's word? Do you have a heart to avoid sin? Those are all evidences of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of you, who's doing a work within you. And so these things we need to kind of grasp onto. Again, you need to make them applicable to your life, to your situation. This is just going to be a rough outline. You know, I, I... just about every study, I make a list of some sort just for understanding. None of these lists are all inclusive. And so it's not everything about everything, just major points, just designed to be major points of the section of Scripture that we have. So what we're going to look at it is, is in a five-step process, really a four-step process. First, we must be led by the Holy Spirit. I'll be going through these again, so I'm just going to read through the list. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. We must build a bridge into somebody's life, a person's life. We must arouse a desire. We must reveal sin and explain the solution. All this with the knowledge that there are going to be those who listen and there will be those who reject. That's just a natural part of how it goes. Matter of fact, the rejection, since we minister in the world, minister to people of the flesh, rejection is going to be on the high side. But keep in mind as well, just just because somebody rejected you that day, doesn't mean that they're going to be rejecting Christ for all of their life. As you've heard the, the saying before, there's some people that plant seeds, there's some people that water seeds, and there's going to be some people that harvest as well. We never know what part we have in it. We just need to do the part that God has told us to do. So the first thing, when sharing your faith, you must be open to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, Jesus is setting this example for us. We've been through this, but I'll read it again. The previous chapter, chapter, I'm sorry, verse 58 through to chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said to them, Most said, Surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Then they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. So, how to be led from the Holy Spirit. How do, how do I know when I move on? or what? Well, at the rejection of Christ. Because what did Jesus just do in verse 58? He said, I am. And the idea was he was proclaiming his deity. They recognized that because they took up stones to stone him. And so as that is going on, what I see this is a picture of, as you proclaim Jesus Christ for who he is, there's going to be the receiving or the rejecting. Well, here's the rejecting. But you move on from those who reject and you go, and sooner or later, I guarantee you, if you're faithful in sharing your faith, you're going to, the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to somebody who is going to be not rejecting, but receiving. And so I have to be open to what the Holy Spirit is speaking to me. If Jesus does not pass by those who would not receive him, he never comes to the blind man who so desperately needed him. In Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10, I'm not going to turn there, but there's the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul knows that God has called him to go out and share the word. He knows that God has called him to go to the Jews that are dispersed from Israel and also to the Gentiles. And he's gone on his missionary journey and 
God's done an amazing thing, planted churches. They come back to Israel, to Jerusalem, and then they want to go back and to, uh, and to strengthen the churches that were, were planted. And so Paul, Paul just knows God's called me to Asia. I would imagine he probably told everybody that. I'm sure he did, because he probably wanted people praying for him. Probably told the church he's going to Asia, and his friends he was going to Asia. The people that were coming with him said, we're going to Asia. But God says, you're not going to Asia. You're going to be going to Greece. And so God gave him that vision of that man, more than likely in a dream. Some people believe that it was good Dr. Luke who appeared to him in a dream, but that's regardless of the fact. Paul was focused upon Asia, but the Holy Spirit changed his heart. Now, are you going to get a dream? Is God going to send somebody to dream? Probably not. Possibly so, but probably not. Back then, the example was being set, and the lessons were being presented for our learning. That I must be led by the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? Well, first it means to be flexible. It means to be open to changes, to not be stringent or rigid in your, in your focus, but to be open to the leading of what God has for you, to be patient, to, to be open to change. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul? Well, if I can't go to Asia, I'm not going anywhere. We've got everything planned in the whole thing. I've already told everybody. What are they going to think? You can offer every excuse in the world, or you can say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Because, see... When God has called you and you're moving in the Lord, the situation, to use a term that I hear a lot lately, is fluid. It's very fluid. Because, see, myself, yourself, we're imperfect people. And sometimes we get a little peace and we explode it and we build it into this whole thing that we ought not to do it. We need to take pieces and we need to take steps of faith. And as we take steps of faith, God's going to bless. But every once in a while, you're, maybe even more than once in a while, you're going to take a wrong step. And when you take a wrong step, that's okay. There's not a problem with that. That's even a good thing. At least you're taking steps. God's going to take you, and he's going to redirect you to where he needs to do, or where he wants you to go. That's exactly what he did with the Apostle Paul. Paul was taking steps, and that's the key. That's why you read the rest of Acts, and Paul's so prominent in it, because he was taking steps. The Holy Spirit just took him. Instead of Asia, he tweaked him over and sent him to Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey, and then over into Greece, he ended up going to Rome. Some people believe that he went to Spain. I don't think he quite made it there. Also, you need to be in prayer. You need to be in prayer because all ministry starts from the position of kneeling. You've got to be in prayer because prayer is the means of communication that God uses. And really, prayer, I should have made it a two-part, be in prayer and be in the Word. Because that's how you have a conversation with God. God's Word speaks to you. Prayer speaks to God then you need to be prepared. You need to be prepared for who you're going to meet. And so, now I'm not talking, we're not going to talk tonight about missions, about going to Africa or the other side of the world or whatever it might be. I'm just talking about going next door. Going next door, or going to the supermarket, or going to the PTA, or going wherever it is that we go. So be prepared. Be prepared for the people I'm going to meet. Who is it that you're going to meet? Well, most of you live in Ontario, Chino, maybe Fontana, just in this general area. You're going to meet people like yourself. You're going to meet middle-class people exactly like yourself. You're going to meet people who are wondering, who in the world do I vote for? I can't vote for Hillary, but do I really want to vote for Don? You know, and just going through these dilemmas. These people who are concerned about their kids in this present age. People that, well, are worried and concerned about the very same things that you are. They have problems, you got the answer. Be humble. Just because you're saved and they're not doesn't mean you're superior to them. The only reason you're saved is because God came into your life. It's all about the Lord and it's not about you. That being the case, when you meet those people who are unsaved, be gracious, be very gracious, be compassionate, and most of all, be patient. Be patient with them because somebody was gracious towards you Somebody was compassionate towards you, and somebody was patient, uh, patient towards you. Do not be judgmental concerning their sin. So, you know, you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, da, 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 and they tell you your sin, it's like, oh, no! I can't believe anybody would do that! No, there's, there's no unforgivable sins. And God has brought you for the purpose of ministering to them because God is well aware of their sin. And so, we can, so we, we can do the dirty dozen or have the nasty nine and have these lists within our minds of the worst things people could do. 
But God doesn't have that list. Sin is sin. I mean, I wish it be to God that we had gay people in here, that they would hear the Word of God and that they would get saved. And that we would have, and you put in whatever's at the top of your list, that they would come in here and they would get saved. Because there's no sin that man can commit that God can't forgive and alter the life of that person. And so regardless of what the sin is, God saw you in your unsaved state the same way that he sees them in their unsaved state. There's no better sinners and worse sinners. They're just all sinners. That being the case, don't get judgmental. Apart from Christ, they're going to hell. With Christ, they'll have eternal life. And then, sixthly, be quiet. Speak God's word, but you don't need your own opinion. We don't need what you think. You need God's word because that's the power of God to save. And see, what that does is that relieves you of a huge burden. What am I going to tell? What I, just preach the word. We're going to be looking at that a little bit now, a couple, next two Sundays. We're going to be looking at what did Paul tell him? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season because it's the word of God that's going to alter their lives. It's not going to be your good ideas or your eloquent speech. It's going to be the Word of God. Secondly, build the bridge. Look at verse 6. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. What do we got here? You have the point of this man's infirmity. You have his blindness. <clears throat> you have the dirt, the dust, the clay. What's man made out of? Well, we see in Genesis, he's made out of dirt. He's made out of clay of the earth. So the idea is man's physical being. And what do you have the application of? Well, saliva, but you need to look at his water or the word of God. And so this is where this change is going to come about from the word of God. So what is Jesus doing? He's building this point of faith. This point of faith in this man. Because see, what the other person is going to have to exhibit at some point is faith. And so I'm building a bridge into their lives. Jesus didn't just say, be healed, because he's teaching a lesson here. But he does give this man a point of faith. Now, he's told this man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. Now, I've been there. I was there, and it's probably about, well, the place that he was, it's probably, I don't remember, it's probably about a half-hour walk or so. So it wasn't just kind of going over there and doing this. It's really outside of the temple and down the hill a ways. And so, for me, that wasn't a big deal. Actually, we went through the Solomon water gate to get there, just as the part of the tour, but you can walk, obviously, over land. But for a blind man, that would be a pretty difficult thing to do. I mean, now think if it was you. You were sitting there, you're blind, you've been blind all your life, been blind, blind since birth. Some guy who you can't even see, you want money, he's not giving you money, he sticks some mud in your eye, he really spits in your eye and tells you to go make this big journey, again, for a blind man, that would be a big journey, and go wash in the pool, and, and you're going to be, would you do it? Would you do it? This man, he's in a desperate situation. He went and did it. He went and put forth the effort. Because he put forth the effort, he could always look back as an encouragement there that as he was obedient to Christ, he can see. God altered his life simply because he was obedient. Now, we need to build a bridge into people's life. And that point of a bridge building was the, the, the washing and, and, and the putting on of that mud in his eye and, and all of that. But the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, this I will turn there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he spoke of something very important. And really what Paul's doing here, he's speaking of the bridges that he builds into the lives of people this door that he uses, or this technique, if you will, to open doors into the life, lives of those God's given him to minister to. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, he says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. I'm free. Paul doesn't, he doesn't need anybody. I mean, he doesn't have to be under bondage. He doesn't have to do what people think he should be doing, you know, and all of this stuff. He's free in Christ, but he says... I've made myself a slave. I'm building a bridge, an opportunity into their lives. Verse 20, And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. When Paul blew into town, what's the first thing that he did? He would go into the synagogue. 
The synagogue was the place where the word of God was being taught. And so he would go into the synagogue because then he would have opportunity to show how Christ fulfilled whatever scripture that they were reading that day. Verse 21, to those who are without the law, as without the law, not being without the law towards God, but under the law towards Christ. Now what he's saying here is, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to minister to, the, to them where they're at, although I'm not going to get involved in their sinful practices. Why? That I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I become as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. And so Paul is willing to do whatever is necessary to do in order to build that bridge. And so what do we do as a church? We go in the parade, 4th of July parade that we were just at. We want to build the bridge, active in the community, to be visible there, to be a participant, to be all things to all men. Vacation Bible school, to invite people here, entertain their kids, maybe just watch their kids. There was one lady who came, said she, but maybe you're even here tonight, I don't know, brought her kid Sunday morning to Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, to their VBS, and then brought their kid here in the evening to our VBS. So you can see how sick and tired the people are of their kids during the summer. Got to have something for these kids to do. And so we provide an opportunity for that. Praise God, come in and drop them off. I remember somebody told me, there's a lady that comes on Sunday morning, drops her kids off, and goes and does whatever she goes. Well, praise God, we got the kids. We got the kids, we're able to minister. Maybe that's going to be a bridge into their lives. Beacon ministry, to minister to people where they're at in their need to be all things so that we have that opportunity. To minister, you know, you can, I can have this attitude. Easter, Easter, we double in size. And it's like I want to stand up and say, where in the world are you people all year long? But see, that's not effective means of building a bridge. That's called alienated people or burning bridges. Don't want to do that but take the opportunity to share the Word of God as you have the opportunity. Maybe we'll see somebody saved. And then what we need to do is to arouse a desire. Verse 7, And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seen. I would imagine that had to be the longest and most exciting journey that that man had ever made. Exciting, is, it gonna, is this going to be it? Am I going to be able to see because again, I pointed it out before, just think of the magnitude of what that must have meant to this man to be born blind, to never see the color red, to never see the color blue, to never see a human face, to never see, and you can just simply go down the list of all the things that we so easily take for granted, and maybe this is going to be the day that I will be able to see. And so... How do we do that? What's an effective means to do that? Well, there's so many different ways to arouse a desire. I, I think the most effective that I've seen is uh, we, we looked at the video series a couple of years ago and probably going to do it towards the end of this year again is the way of the master. The way of the master, just simply to arouse that desire. Now, how is a man gonna, or woman going to have a desire when they see the need for what you have to present? And so the way of the master is designed to show people this desire that maybe they don't even know that they have. Speaking to somebody, and when I've done street witnessing, do the same way, if you were to die today, where would you go? Now the vast majority, there's a bunch of answers, but the vast majority, I would go to heaven. Why would you go to heaven? I would go to heaven because I'm a good person. Can I ask you a couple questions? You know, and, and that's what I do. You know, I, I, I was out in front of Rite Aid, and when we went out one time, one time it's go, you know, I'm a pastor of a local church and kind of doing a survey. If you died today, where would you go? And again, I'd go to heaven. Why would you go to heaven? Because you're a good, oh, can I ask you a couple questions about that? Now, I'm not, you know, being overly separated, studious, whatever. Hey, can I ask you a couple questions? You're just conversational. Can I ask you a couple questions? That good person? I've never met a good person before. I don't say that, but, but I kind of present it that way. And yeah, yeah, and so they're, you know, they're ready to defend their goodness because they got it all set in their mind because they've been trying to convince themselves like, for a long time, and now they're finally able to say it out loud. Have you ever told a lie before? And the first reaction is usually, because <laughs> now they're starting to think every stinking lie they ever said. And yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I told a lie, little, a white lie, little ones. That's what everybody said, little, little lies. What does that make you to be? A liar, I guess. 
It's because you want them to say, you don't want to tell them you're a liar, you want them to say, I'm a liar. Have you ever stolen anything before? <laughs> oh yeah, when I was a kid. Uh, what does that make you to be? A stealer? Because they always got the liar-stealer thing. Well, a thief. Yeah, okay, I'm a thief. All right. Have you ever lusted after somebody before? <laughs> yeah, well, you're not such a great person, are you? And so what you're doing is you're, you're, you're arousing a desire and what you're forcing them to do to see the reality of their situation. See, they've been able to lie to themselves, to gloss it over, or they're comparing themselves to some bad person somewhere else, and they're just thinking that, well, at least I'm better than them, so that makes me a good person. But in actuality, they're realizing that they're not good at all. All of mankind is suffering because of sin and the effects of sin, and that needs to be brought to the forefront, but it needs to be brought in the forefront, not in a con condemning way, but in a way that's going to arouse a desire for what Christ has for them. Because what you're doing is you're bringing them to the edge of despair. When you bring them to the edge of despair, there's only one way to go is down, unless there's God. And God is going to lift them up. They make the decision. And so you come to the edge of despair without Christ, well then you're just a dead man. You're, you're going to burn in the fires of hell. But wait a minute, somebody came to alter that situation to give you another way, to give you a choice in the direction that you want to take. And so what could arouse a greater desire than the words, I was where you are right now until something happened in my life. Again, comes back to the testimony. What is it? What is it? Now, they may not even say that, but they want to know because all of a sudden they've been faced with their own mortality and their own sinful nature. Something's got to happen. I, I've tried to ignore this. They would be maybe not thinking of those in detail, but I, I, I've done the Dr. Phil thing. I've done the Oprah thing. I've done the self-help book thing and all of this, and still there's that. We know what it is. It's the conviction of the Holy Spirit of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that they're a sinner that there's a God, and that they're going to be judged. They tried to mask that over, but they're having to face the reality of it here. We need to arouse that desire, awaken that desire for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you're able now at this point to show them what Christ has done in your life because it's so obvious that if God's done something in your life, then He can maybe do something in my life. And then you need to explain the solution. <clears throat> verses 8 through 10. Therefore, the neighbors and those who had previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? Some others said, This is, the one, this is he. Others said, He is like him. He said, I'm him. I am he. Therefore, they said to him, How were your eyes open? He answered and said, A man called Jesus. A man called Jesus. Nothing that we previously talked about means absolutely anything unless you give them the solution for their condition. Jesus Christ and Him crucified for your sins. It's not about saying a prayer. That can be used, but they have to hear about Jesus. They have to hear that although they're a sinner, Christ paid the price. It's not, I mean, you do them a disservice if they come to the conclusion that they're a sinner and you say, well, just say this prayer and you'll be okay. Because that's not how it works. They, they've got to enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And again, they need to consider. Now, you, can enter, you need to tell them, you can enter into this relationship at any time. But you have to do it with genuineness of heart. Now, I had a hard time just saying, you know, hearing the gospel and saying, okay, with genuine so hard, I receive him. I had to mold it over. I had to mull it over, and I had to weigh things out, and I had to come, and I, you know, I'm saying it that way because that's what I was doing, but in actuality, what was happening was Christ was ministering to me so that I would know and understand who he was and the magnitude of what he was. And then when I came to that understanding, and then it was then that I was able to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. And again, it wasn't about saying the prayer. This prayer, in actuality, was an after effect of that. Any outward expression is going to be an outward reaction of what Christ has done within you. If I give an invitation and ask for a raising of hands, if that person is genuinely being saved, he's saved before he lifts the hand up. The lifting of the hand is what is a 
uh, an outward sign of what has already occurred inside or the walking down or whatever it might be. And so Christ is doing that work inside, and it's a personal work. So you need to tell him how your eyes were open. What worked in my life? Well, a person named so-and-so spoke the gospel to me, and I was blind before, but now I see. I was washed with water. I was washed with water, and I became clean, and I became white as snow. And so the whole idea about what God does, and it's an amazing work, is simply by the spoken word, which is in actuality the reflection of the light of Christ into the lives of others. You need to take these things, as I said before. You need to digest these things into your life. Now, I'm talking to people, I believe, who are saved here tonight. And you need, how, God, how, how would you use these things in my life? There's Harry over there, and Harry's a heathen. And I've been wondering, how do I minister to Harry? Harry's kind of loud, and Harry's kind of abrupt, and so I'm kind of intimidated by Harry. But the thing about it is, if Harry's lost, is all Harry needs to hear is the gospel. And again, you have these means that we talked about to build this bridge into Harry's life that you can give him the opportunity. But it's Harry's responsibility. Really, you're reflecting the word. You're not the source of the light. You're reflecting the light. And so this is between God and Harry. You're just the middleman. You're just the messenger, whatever it might be. But you need to have the messenger. How will Harry hear without a preacher? And the idea is he won't because that's the means which God has ordained for Harry to hear. Your name's Harry, isn't it, Duke? That's why I'm pointing over here. <laughs> yeah, be quiet. That's why Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So what exactly do I do? Well, I, I do really appreciate the, uh, the way of the master, and that means I really believe it shows, it uses properly the Old Testament to bring people to the awareness of sin, brings in the New Testament with Jesus Christ. Another effective way that's been around for a long time, you can Google it, I'll go through the, the steps, is the Romans Road as well. Romans Road, first, is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's the necessity to know that you're a sinner. Because if you don't know that you're a sinner, then why would you need a Savior? And then Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates His love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, he didn't die for the holy or for the righteous because they wouldn't need anybody to die for them. He died for sinners. So you come to the awareness that I'm a sinner, and then you come to the awareness that Christ died for me. As far as that life, if you would continue to grow, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. What you will receive for a sinful life is going to be death, but the gift of God, the grace of God, is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. There's the grace that is there that is going to alter the course of your life. And then Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 12, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, or the inner person, man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So what has occurred in the heart, it will be expressed outwardly. Walking down an aisle, raising a hand, just with your mouth, whatever it might be. These things are essential. Now, Romans Road just kind of leaves out one little thing. It doesn't really leave it out, but it's not real clear. And we're going to go ahead and close from there. Turn over to Luke chapter 13. Just a book to the left. Luke chapter 13. <clears throat> we see the necessary element of repentance. Look at the point that the Lord makes here. Verse 1. There were present at that season some who told them about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they sacrificed such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Are those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. 
People are concerned about the natives in those remote jungles, or they're concerned about, you know, well, what about those people? How could God allow those people to die that have, and you can fill in the blank of any disaster. And what people are doing is, as you're going through Romans Road, you're going through Way of the Master, they're trying to reflect those things from them. They're trying to insulate themselves from the conviction that they're feeling. I know because that's how I operated for a big part of my, my heathenship. But notice what Jesus said here, and see the importance of it. Don't let it get past you. Unless you repent, you will perish. He didn't say, unless you say the prayer, you'll perish. Unless you repent, unless you stop the direction of the flesh you're going and turn and come to the Spirit. Now again, that turning point is going to be the Word of God. But notice what he says, there's got to be, it can't just be continue to live that life that you were living before and said, yeah, I said the prayer, or I walked down the aisle, or I did whatever, I gave the nod, and continue to walk down that way. That person is continuing, continually headed towards judgment. It's got to be to that point that you're stopped. The Word of God stops you in your tracks, and you truly consider the way you're going, and consider the way Christ has set for you, you stop and you take God's direction. Is this works-based salvation? No, Jesus said this. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll be just as dead as those other people. But he's speaking in this particular case in spiritual things. So there's the absolute necessity as we teach the word to show them, to let them know that Christ died for their sins, but you must come to Christ. You must come to Christ. And the only way that you can come to Christ is by faith through belief and entering into that. Now, they do need to forsake their sin, and I do need to let them know that, but i got to allow God to do the cleanup work. I just present the solution, and then I can almost step, I mean, I continue to disciple people, but step aside and watch God do the work. There's some people that, I, that have made supposedly a decision for Christ, and I don't think they're saved. I don't know, because it's between them and God, but it's not looking good. There's other people where you're kind of confused. You're just not really sure. But man, there's some people that there's just absolutely no doubt. And those testimonies of those people, even to me today, are the strongest encouragement of what God's able to do in a life. I mentioned Corey and Cece. To see them coming back to, to Christ and to see them wanting to dig into their relationship with Jesus Christ I just see a change of mind and a change of attitude that has brought them back to where they need to be. And again, you should be able to see that same exact thing in your life as well. Father, once again, we just thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your graciousness. I pray, Father, for those who are here now, for those who hear this message, I pray, Father, that we would be found faithful in it. I pray, Father, as we are, we would see the miracle and the beauty of salvation just as surely as this blind man received his sight, that we can see that just a great miracle and people see in their spiritual sight as they come into a saving knowledge of who you are. And so, Father, I pray that we would see the necessity of being full in on this, full in of those who are to be the reflectors of your glory and full in of those, Lord, who are receptors of your glory. And so we just thank you for this evening. I pray, Father, that you would make this this message fluid in our lives, that you would make this applicable, Father, to the situation, circumstances, to those people whom you have called us to. And Lord, as you do, we would simply see your gospel go out into this dark world, that we would see how light is truly able to overcome. Show us this miracle, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you all stand, please? Next week, we're going to be having a special guest. Sherry Youngward is going to be coming and leading worship for us next week. So invite you to come out, invite others to come out as well. Uh, Sunday, we're going to be continuing in 2 Timothy, and Sunday evening, we'll be in the book of Isaiah. Um, God's doing a great work. You know, we, we kind of have some of these peripheral ministries, and I just call them peripheral because they're not before us. We've got the convalescent home. That's a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Ontario. We've got to look at that as an extension of our church. It means we pray for those people and concern for those people. Also, on Monday night, we have seasons of sorrow, people that are coming because of grief. They've lost a loved one. And God's doing a really neat work in that. So when you think about it, when you see it in the bulletin, lift it up in prayer. 
God bless you guys. Have a great rest of the week.